you're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with the healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. Welcome to the Doc Lounge Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey Doyle, Senior Director of Marketing at Pacific Companies. Today, we're thrilled to have Dr. Flora Waples with us, a pioneering force in the field of medical aesthetics and longevity science. Dr. Waples, founder and medical director of Restore Medical Spa, has an extraordinary journey from emergency medicine to the fast-paced world of entrepreneurship. After 15 years in emergency medicine and a stellar education at the University of Chicago and Wheel Cornell Medical College, Dr. Waples co-founded Restore with her sister, Dominique. Together, they built one of the fastest growing aesthetics companies in the country with locations spreading across Colorado and beyond. Dr. Waples is passionate about helping people transform their lives through personalized wellness and regenerative medicine. Let's dive into hearing more about her inspiring journey. Welcome to the Doc Lounge podcast, Dr. Waples. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We're excited to have you on and we want to learn all about your journey from, you know, being a physician, an ER physician to then becoming a really amazing entrepreneur that's founded your own aesthetics business. And I know it's growing and expanding. So first, tell us a little bit, how did you get into emergency medicine? What made you pick that specialty? Well, you know, it was it really was kind of love at first sight. Um, when I did my first rotation, um, you know, in med school, I did my first emergency room rotation. The first shift I was there, it was pretty much, I was like, well, these are my people. <laughs> this, is exact, this is exactly where I belong. But the story that I, I always tell people, I think this applies to entrepreneurship as well. Um, you know, when I, was in, um, when I was in school, high school, college, med school, all throughout school, whenever there was a test, I would always score in like the top quarter. You know, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, but somewhere in the top quarter. But I would always finish the test in half the time, right? So you could give me an infinite amount of time. I'll never score higher than like the top, like 75%, right? But if everyone had to take it in the time that I finished it in, I would score the best. So I can do a solid job in half the time. And I was like, well, where is that a benefit? <laughs> you know, like there, there are fields where that is worthless and there are fields where that is like exactly, you know, what you need to do. And so, um, so emergency medicine really is a place where that ability to make quick decisions, to pivot, to just make a call and move on um, was, was really, really useful. And, and uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what drew me to it. I love that. Well, that makes a lot of sense. You're like, I'm quick on my feet. I can, you know, get things done in, in, in a very accurate and um, successful way. So that that makes a lot of sense. Now, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your journey as an ER doctor, how long you were you're, I mean, I think you're still, you're obviously still a practicing physician, but tell us a little bit about that and your ex- experience there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, I did, after, after residency, um, I came out to Colorado and I, I did about 15 years of emergency medicine that sort of in a variety of settings. Um, I, I love I love all of them. I, I've worked in sort of that larger academic setting where you got all the residents around all the time and all the specialists and everyone's there. And I worked some at a uh, with a company that staffs like rural ERs where I would drive out to different parts of the state and like do like a you know two day or three day like just you know seventy two hour shift and, and then drive home and and um, that was also really wonderful because you know in in the larger more urban settings you have all of the support and and you have all of these people around you and, and it feels you know really safe and you can do these amazing things um and then in rural settings you're in the situation where it's like it's you and you got two nurses and there's a snowstorm and so you have no helicopters and you have no ambulances and if someone comes in like it's it's you <laughs> and that person for as long as it takes the roads to open um so so i've worked in a bunch of different settings um i've i've loved all of them it was a wonderful career um and you know i was just i'm really really grateful to have been able to have the experiences that i had but you know the thing i'll tell you you know sort of where that journey kind of came to its natural you know, turning point um you know part of it i was i was i was doing these 72 hour shifts at this with this rural location loved the medicine loved all the people i worked with just absolutely adored the patient population but i was gone for these long chunks of time you know and i'd come home and like my kids you know like their hair would be like ratty and they'd be crying and my husband's crying <laughs> it's the house is a disaster and i was tucking my daughter in uh to bed one night and she was um in five or six and she said well mommy she's like um when i grow up do i need to be a doctor 
And because my husband's a physician too. And so this, like her whole parent base, this is all she knows, right? And I was like, well, no, sweetie, you don't need to be a doctor. You can be anything you want. Um, I was like, but what, you know, tell me, tell me more about that. And she's like, I don't, I don't want to be a doctor. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm like, tell, tell me why. And she says, mommy, I don't want to be a doctor because I don't want to make my kids sad because I'm gone all the time. I was like, oh. Right yeah. in the fields, yeah. you know, and so, um, so you know, it is a wonderful career, but it is a career that can be that can be hard, you know, on on a, on a family life. So that's when I was like, well, I got to do something different. <laughs> so, I well, I I appreciate that personal story and journey of of you know hearing that, and obviously that kind of you know started something in your mind or the gears turn and like, okay, mm -hmm. what 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 else is there for me, you know, out mm -hmm. there? So then how did you kind of take that and pivot into becoming an entrepreneur and yeah. into um, wellness and aesthetics? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that, you know, from that point, it took many years you know, to get out because building, building a business that can support you takes a really long time. Like that, that is, a, it's, if it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. Um, so at that point, um, you know, my, my sister was an attorney. She was a, a practicing a prosecuting attorney for the city of Denver. I was working in the ER here. And we had always had this idea that that maybe we could like be business partners and work together because we get along really well. Our strengths complement each other just just really really well. Also, like with a sister, you've had it every fight. Like every fight that's ever going to happen, you've had it. You know, like there's no questions about whether or not the relationship is going to last because you're, you're sisters. You're stuck, right? So um, so we always had this idea, and and we kind of tossed around like, what is it that that kind of a doctor and a lawyer can can do together? What you know, what what can we do together? And you know, we were both getting into our sort of like mid to late thirties, and um, we were both starting to have wrinkles. <laughs> and I went, I first time I ever had Botox, I went to the spa that was owned by a, a dear friend of mine from residency. She did my Botox. I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, I can do this. I could do this. It's not, you know, I, I could totally do this. And so Dominique and I kind of talked about it and we decided, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and we, you know, we, you know, I wanted out of sort of institutionalized clinical medicine. There's a lot of things about that that can be very, very, you know, difficult. Um, and both, you know, so morally and emotionally and physically, I, w I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be able to take care of people in, in a different kind of way. Dominique wanted out of law. And so we just, we just quit our jobs and just did it. <laughs> and it was, it was a tight and very scary um, couple of years um, in, the, in the beginning. But um, yeah, there, there was really not a whole lot of preparation or planning or anything like that. We're just like, well, this is where we're going. And we rented a spot and opened up and that's where we went. <laughs> I hear that a lot about entrepreneurship. It's you got to make that leap. And, yeah. you know, once you feel confident to do it, you just got to go for it. So it sounds like that's what you and your sister did. So kudos to you both, because that's an exciting pivot. Um, so tell me, I mean, obviously, I'm assuming, you know, there's many things that you kind of had to consider, but what about like location and, and how did you, you know, go about that as, you know, yeah. your background was more medical versus business? Yeah. I mean, there, there was, you know, it was a steep learning curve, you know, um, the first location that we opened was four blocks from our house. We, we lived in side by side duplexes at this point. So it was about four blocks from our house. And um, the reason we chose that location is because we're in a neighborhood where everyone was very much like us. Um, women kind of, you know, late 30s to mid 50s, you know, professional careers, families, you know, it was it was a demographic that we really knew and understood. And so the first time we had, we had no market research, we had no demographics data, we had absolutely nothing. We just looked around the neighborhood and we're like, everyone here has crow's feet, we can do this, <laughs> you know, and, and opened up. Um, now we have, you know, we have this absolutely wonderful company called, um, called Buxton, which does, um, does demographics research, you know, for, they basically, you say, here's, here's my patient population. And, you know, and they will find street corners for you where they say, okay, there's, there's 300,000 you know, people within a mile that have exactly your perfect demographics, you know, um, for you. So now our location selection is much more professional. Um, mm -hmm. The first one we opened, it was honest to God, it was just a good guess. Um, and it's gotten, it's gotten better ever since then. But now, now we have someone say, okay, you need to be at the corner of these two streets or, you know, here's four locations where you could open up and be wildly successful. And that helps a lot. Love that. Um, that's very insightful as to like, okay, location, location, location. So that, that nice. you got lucky at first and it was strategic. Also, you were thinking about it from a, the right way. And then now you're partnering with somebody where you're getting that data real time, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about, I mean, 
what else, you know, you guys have grown significantly. Now you have, you know, I think over 25 employees, three locations, and you're continuing to expand. What factors do you think brought, a, you know, this rapid growth? That's a great question um, because that, that always has so many factors in it. Um, I would say the, the biggest, I'll say a couple things. The first thing I would say is, you know, if speaking, you know, to physicians, if you're a physician, thinking about you know, opening up your own practice, you need to have a partner who's going to dedicate themselves to the business side, right? Because we are trained to, you know, we are trained in medicine. All of us got into medical school because we're very smart. We've always been the smartest person in the room, right? But being the smartest person in the room doesn't mean that you have the knowledge necessary for every decision in the room, right? And if you're going to be in the in the patient care rooms, you know, delivering care or coordinating care or working with patients, that's that's my specialty is medicine. That, that's what I do. That's what I love. Um, my sister, she runs the business side, and it's been absolutely. I mean, she, you know, I could not have succeeded without somebody helping manage that business side because I know nothing about it. I'll just give away all the care for free, and that's not a good business plan, as it turns out. So it's really important that there be somebody who is able to dedicate themselves to the business. I see, you know, people go into aesthetics all the time. It's a field that people see as a because of escape hatch, you know, commonly. And what happens is they open up one place and they're seeing patients all the time. And because they are seeing patients all the time, they don't have any energy or time with which to grow the business. And they stall out at one location. What they've done is they have given themselves a new job. It's not, they don't have freedom. You know, they're not an entrepreneur. They just have a different job where they're still putting in the same hours. So you've got to have somebody running the business. And so whether that's a partner, whether that's a practice manager, you've got to have somebody who's doing those things because a doc, you can't see patients and do that at the same time. Um, the other thing that was really, really important um, for, for the growth of Restore is when, you know, again, speaking, you know, two docs as a doc, when a doc opens up a practice, you can do it in one of two ways, right? You can do it where, you know, it's the Flora show and I'm the amazing injector and I'm going to do all the procedures and it's going to be amazing, right? Um, if you decide to run it in that way, you will never be able to grow beyond one or two locations because there's only a certain number of hours you're available, right? I decided really early on that I didn't want it to be the Flora show, right? Anyone's this Dr. Waples, that's not the point. The point is, am I smart enough to figure out everything that happens inside my brain when I look at a patient, decide what I'm going to do and teach that to someone else and, and make that something that is, you know, sort of protocolizable and delegatable so that now I have 20 people who are doing, making the same decisions that I would make, you know, obviously asking me questions when they need to. Now I have the ability to scale. Now I have the ability to expand and to change my scope. If you make it a pra your practice and it's about you, it, there's a there's a limit to that, you know. And there's nothing wrong with being having a one location that's really awesome. You have a job you love. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want to grow, you have to take yourself out of the treatment room um, because otherwise you're going to be always capped. Great advice. Um, and and tell me, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of the background from obviously your days as an ER doctor and you know your aspects of you know what patient care you know should look like helped when she made this pivot. So is that, you know, tell us a little bit about that journey, because it sounds like that has gone into the training yeah. of your team now. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's tough because, you know, when you go into one of the established branches of medicine, you know, orthopedic surgery or ER, internal medicine, whatever you do, there's, there's a residency program, right? And all the training is set up and you go through the residency program. When you come out the back end, Everybody who looks at your resume knows that you have the skills and you have the training to take care of anything that happens inside that branch of medicine, right? The thing about aesthetics and sort of rejuvenative medicine and wellness is that this is a field which is just, it's in its early stages. It didn't even exist 15 years ago. Like it wasn't a thing, you know, 15 years ago. And it's just exploding in size, exploding in terms of what we can do and what, what we're capable of. But there are no formal training programs. There is no way to, to say, okay, I'm going to go to this university and get this degree, and now I'm an aesthetics practitioner. Um, so you really have to put it together piecemeal. Um, and that takes a lot of time, and, and it's difficult to do. So for me personally, the, the way that I sort of got the training that I needed, um, I started attending meetings. First thing I did is start attending sort of big national meetings and listening to the lectures. Um, I, you can, there's, there's sort of private individuals kind of all over the country who will hold trainings, and they'll show you how to inject, and you bring in models, and they'll show you the procedures. And so I did a bunch of those things. And you sort of have to, to, have, to kind of put it together, little pieces like that, um, to get the expertise you need to do the medicine. So 
it is difficult because there's no one centralized source. Um, but if I was speaking again to somebody, you know, thinking of coming into this field, the first thing I would do is say, okay, um, the first thing you have to do is go to, you know, first year, go to three separate conferences, put on by three separate companies, you know, go listen to the lectures, watch the, you know, the demonstrations, everything else like that. And then when you have that background, then start pulling, you know, start calling up um, the way that you typically would do trainings is you call you know, somebody who advertised themselves as a trainer and you set up a day where you can go to their office, three or four of your best girlfriends, go in, you do a bunch of injections, you learn how to do the hands-on piece and you kind of go from there. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's no one centralized place. You got to do it yourself. And it sounds like, because I know that you, you know, and your locations of Restore are known for their expertise in, you know, re regenerative medicine, hormone replacement therapy, you know, and longevity. So can you share a little bit about how all of these, you know, specialties really contribute yes. to a holistic approach to aging? Absolutely. Well, we started, you know, when Restore started, we did only aesthetics. Um, and this, again, I was in my late 30s. That was all I needed. <laughs> and so those, that was the thing that I was really thinking about. So we started off with aesthetics. And we did only aesthetics for, for about 10 years. And, um, and then I hit menopause. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. And um, so I went back to school. I, you know, and also I, I I'd kind of, you know, the goal has never been to drape healthy skin over a sick body. Right. The goal really is for someone to look as good as they feel and feel as good as they look. We want want, you know, healthy from the inside, healthy from, from the outside. Both. So I went back to school um, and I did a fellowship in, um, you know, in hormone replacement um, and sort of menopausal care, which was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. It took me about a year mm -hmm. and I had this deal with myself. I was like, OK, I am not allowed to write myself any prescriptions until I finish the fellowship <laughs> because <laughs> there's nothing in the world that's worse than a doc who thinks they're smart going off half cocked. Right. I was like, I have to finish it before I can do anything. And then I treated myself and, and, and sort of friends and family for about a year just to make sure that I kind of, you know, had some experience and it was, it was just, I mean, absolutely transformational and, and wonderful, wonderful medicine. And, and, you know, it filled such a hole, you know, in my heart because in, in hospital medicine, you're always fighting a losing battle. Always, 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 right? Um, something horrible happens and you try to fix it. And then something horrible happens and you try to fix it. And every time that happens, the patient loses a little ground. You know, like like you can get them back. Hopefully you can get them back 99% of what they were before or maybe like 80% of what they were before. But you're, you're losing. You're losing all the time. And the patient's losing all the time. And that's that's hard. That, that's really hard, I think, for, for all medical providers. And um, in sort of, you know, hormone replacement and, and optimization care, what happens is someone comes in and I can make them better than they were before. And each time they come in, I can make them stronger and feeling better. And, and you know, they, they function better. They feel better. And that's an amazing thing. You never get to do that in medicine to actually, to, for you and your patient to actually win um, a battle together is, is really cool. So um, it's kind of a long rambling answer. I hope I, got, I, hope I covered what you were asking me, but no, that's I, how it came to be. I find that fascinating. And it sounds like you really, you know, you you studied and got, you know, did a fellowship to learn more about this. And it seems like it's a field where they're just starting to get more advancements and there's more of a focus on, you know, women going through menopause or perimenopause. So um, it sounds like you're kind of on, you know, you're leading there, which is, which is amazing. So how does, how, with all that knowledge and all that wisdom, how do you approach creating, you know, these personalized treatment plans for your patients? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the first step for me is it, you know, it always comes back to education, right? So there's two different kind of ways that you can set up a medical practice where the physician is, you know, the, the, the medical director is not going to be the person seeing the patients, every single patient, every single time. One way that you can do it is you is you take your your mid level providers, so your your RNs, your NPs, your PAs, whoever you have, and you write really really tight protocols, low levels of education, tight protocols, and the protocols limit what they can do, and the protocol protects the patient. Now the benefit of doing it that way is you can train people really fast, right? It doesn't take very long for you to say to someone, "Hey, here's the protocol, follow it, go." You know, um, it, it's 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 a fast and cheap way to get people up on the floor, and the protocol protects the patient. Um, the downside of doing it that way is that it does not allow for much personalization, right? You write these really narrow protocols and that's what the patient's going to get. And they'll be right most of the time. I mean, the whole thing about protocols is they're right like 85, 90% of the time, you know, but they're going to be wrong some percentage of the time. The other sort of way that you can go about building your practice is you say, okay, 
I'm going to write general protocols and I'm going to invest deeply in the education of my people. And I'm going to create experts out of my people and their expertise is going to be what protects the patient. And then because you've got somebody who's, who's good enough that they know when you got to change the rules, you know, sometimes someone will need a little more, a little less than a narrow protocol would say because of something about their anatomy or physiology, what have you. Um, when somebody has sort of that deeper level of understanding, they can make that call correctly. So, you know, the way that we have chosen to do it at Restore is when, when we hire somebody, we spend hundreds of hours and, and they, it takes between nine months and a year before they are fully trained and allowed to go out and treat all of our patients. We, we invest hugely into, into each of our patient, people and, um, and they're absolutely amazing. Our, our providers are, are amazing. We, we, on average, we screen about 100 people for each one person we hire. We get about 100 applicants for each one person we hire. We're very, very particular, which we're lucky to be able to be particular, <laughs> but we are. And, um, and they get a tremendous, tremendous education and they come out experts and that's, that's what makes us good. I, that's something that I just don't, you know, even though it costs more and it takes more time than, than a lot of practices do, um, I think it's worth it. And I think it's important. So that's what we do. Smart, smart business approach for your clients and patients. Now, all right, let's switch to something fun. Tell us about what's the most memorable uh, success story that you've had with one of your clients. Oh, goodness. Um, would it be too weird if I told you about myself? No. <laughs> I, I would lo we'd love to learn. <laughs> well, I'll tell you I, I, can, I can tell you an aesthetic story or I can tell you a sort of hormone and regeneration story. What would you prefer? Because I, I, they're, they're kind of different and they come from different sides. What would you like? Yeah, let's hear about um, hormonal regeneration. I think that's fascinating. Right. So, so, um, so when I was 42, um, I was about uh, 20 pounds overweight. I was pre-diabetic because diabetes runs in my family. Like literally every human in my family turns diabetic at the age of 40. And I was on that train. Uh, my hemoglobin A1C was elevated at all this stuff. Um, I was, I could run, couldn't run a mile. Like literally could not run a mile. My knees hurt all the time. Um, I was waking up at night, every night, about, about two or three in the morning and being awake for like an hour or two, which happens to most women when they get perimenopausal. Um, we start waking up at night and not be able to sleep through the night. Had zero interest in my partner whatsoever. He's a wonderful man. It's not his fault, but I was just like, ugh, intimacy, mm -hmm. gross. You know, like that libido just came off a cliff. Um, and, you know, and I was, I was, I was grumpy. I was irritated. I was angry. I was gaining weight and couldn't sleep and, and, and was losing my enjoyment of life. And, and this is something that happens to a lot of people. Like as, as we get into our forties, this is, this is relatively common, you know? And I had this experience where I went to, I went to my, my primary physician who not only is she a, a great physician, she's also a personal friend and I know her, she's highly educated. She cares, she tries, you know? And I said, these are all the things I can't sleep. I'm gaining weight. Like I, I can't exercise. I mean, I'm tired all the time. Like, you know, all, these are the things that are happening. What's wrong? And, and she sort of does all my labs. She's like, well, your labs are all normal. And I was like, she's like, you're just getting old. Like, you're, you're just, this is what it feels like to be a woman in your 40s. You're just getting old. And I was like, oh, I was like, you know, I hear you. I understand where you're coming from. We trained, you know, in the same institution. I understand what you're saying. I was like, I can't accept that that is the answer for the rest of my life. Like, I can't, I mean, I'm not going to accept that the rest of my life is just going to be just, just, just continued loss of, of function that, that, that that's it, that this is, that this is it forever. I can't accept that. And um, so that's when I, I decided to do a hormone replacement fellowship and I did it and I started treating myself. And, you know, the thing is, as we lose our hormonal support, the way we feel and function declines, that's what happens in our forties. But when you replace those lost hormones, when you replace those lost instructions that your body needs to function optimally, you gain back those functions that you've lost. So last year I ran a 20 mile trail race. Um, wow. I have lost 20 pounds. I am no longer pre-diabetic. I sleep through the night. My husband's a very happy man. You know, like all of those things, like the way that I felt and was able to function in my late twenties and early thirties, I've gotten those back. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is a really wonderful thing. That's something that I can give to my patients. And that's something that I hear from my patients kind of every day. They come in, they go, Oh my God, I didn't realize how bad I felt until I started to feel better. And now I'm looking at it, I'm like, how could I allow myself to live like that, you know? But, um, you know, unfortunately, traditional medicine is really disease focused. And, and if there's not a disease, you don't treat. And aging is not considered to be a disease, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's not a disease, they're like, well, aging's natural. This is what aging is. 
mm-hmm. you know, roll with it. And um, whereas in sort of the medicine that we're doing now, regenerative medicine, the idea is, well, not only is aging a disease, aging is a disease. It's, it's the only disease that everyone gets. It's the only disease that kills 100% of people that get it. Like, yeah, you treat aging to prevent the diseases of aging. You don't wait till they come up and then try to t- treat, you know, the hypertension, diabetes, whatever. No, treat the aging, treat the underlying problem. And, and you can make that stuff just go away. And that's a really cool concept. So that's something that I, you know, I find just really exciting and really fun. And as far as the aesthetic side, like I'm super vain. So that's nice too. <laughs> so like, uh, but no, it's, it's a very, it's an exciting, it's a really exciting time to, to be in this branch of medicine. That was so enlightening. I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. And, and it sounds like, yeah, it is, you know, shifting your mindset of, you know, really being more preventative and ways to actually improve. Yeah, Yeah, I love that. Now, I know you speak at a lot of industry events. What are some of, you know, the most exciting innovations or trends that you're, you know, think are going to shape medicine that you're focused on? Well, you know, I I do think that, you know, when, when modern medicine was invented, which was really like the early 1900s, you know, in in that era, you know, (laughs) treatment of disease was the crushing need of humanity, right? Like there was no point in having sort of rejuvenative or aesthetic medicine because we were dying in our 40s, you know? So, so you got to fix the first problems first, right? So, so modern medicine really evolved with this goal of treating disease and, and we've been wildly successful, right? We, we've doubled the human lifespan. That's an incredible achievement. Um, but we are getting to, at least my, my perspective, my opinion is, is we are starting, we're starting to get to the end of what d- disease care can do. Right. And we are, you know, and what I believe will be the next major or one of the next major changes, of course, the the immunotherapies, those are absolutely huge. And there's all there's some, you know, things that are coming there that are amazing. But we are starting to realize now we've got this doubled lifespan. Now we're trying to figure out how to make those those years healthy years um, through the use of preventative medicine. And, you know, this is true. I see this in aesthetics and I see this in the sort of longevity conferences that I attend. They're kind of growing together like this, because if you think about aesthetics, the way aesthetics started. And the way that I would say 85% of it is done now is we are using tools to make tissue appear better, right? Uh, you inject like tox. I, mean, I, I do Botox, obviously, like I'm a, you know, I'm like an alcoholic that opened a bar. Like I do all the things, right? <laughs> so when, you know, when you put neuromodulators or Botox into skin, what you're doing is you're, you're, it's a, it's a relaxer. It relaxes the muscle. So the muscle can't pull at the skin and it can't make lines, right? Well, you're not solving the underlying problem. The underlying problem is, is that the skin has lost its ability to repair itself and lost its thickness and lost its strength. And all kinds of stuff. But you're making it look better, but you're not solving the underlying problem. Over the last 10 years, and, and most of aesthetics is kind of like that. Over the last 10 years, what I've been seeing is more and more regenerative therapies where we're actually, instead of you know, using something artificial to create a look that appears more youthful, we actually are starting to have these interventions now where we can actually make the tissue youthful again. And you see that in aesthetics and you see that in longevity medicine, both. And that's really cool Um, because one, it looks a lot better, right? A lot of the problem with some of our older therapies is they didn't really look natural because they weren't. I mean, go figure, right? Um, But we're starting to be able to do that. And and that's where I think that um, this branch of medicine anyway is going, is is away from sort of synthetic interventions and towards sort of biological regeneration, which is really cool. just really cool medicine. It's fun. It's so fun to be at the forefront of that. That's is really neat. So that's what I think. Sounds like you're very passionate about this and, it, and, and no, that sounds really, you know, exciting and, and different from, you know, what we've heard in the past. So love that insight there. Um, finally, I'd love to hear, you know, what advice would you give to other physicians considering making a move, you know, into becoming an entrepreneur? Um, what I would say, without sounding snarky, you know, don't quit your J-Dub yet. <laughs> um, you know, because, like, and I'll tell you just from my own journey, generally speaking, most businesses are going to lose money for the first several years um, because it takes a while to figure out what the heck you're doing, to get your people in place, to get your systems in place. It just, it just takes time. And so when I opened, when, you know, my sister and I, when we opened Restore, um, the first, I believe, five years we were open, I did not draw a paycheck. Um, I was working full-time restore during the day, and then I was working evenings and weekend shifts in the ER. So I was working, you know, sort of, you know, one and a half um, jobs, and that's how I was able to keep, you know, food on the table for my family. Um, you know, 
because the, the understanding was that, that we would have to put that in. So if you are looking at entrepreneurship, first of all, there are pluses and minuses, but whichever, we'll talk about those in a second. But before you do that, make sure that you've got a cash cushion, in whatever form that takes, that stocks or whatever it is, or you know, keeping part-time at a regular job. You need to have a cash cushion for at least three years, all right? Do not ever listen to any kind of rep or salesperson that says that your business will be profitable, like you know, the month you open your doors. That's not true. <laughs> make sure you have a cushion. The second thing is that there are pluses and minuses to entrepreneurship, as, as is true with all things, right? And you just got to pick, you got to decide whether or not you really, really want that. So the benefit of entrepreneurship and what everyone always, you know, like thinks of is, is you have freedom, right? You have, you have the ability to set your schedule. You have the ability to set the demands that are placed upon you. You have the ability to build a practice that looks like what you want, as opposed to being told how you can treat your patients, which is something that's very hard in that there's friction there with a lot of, um, a lot of doctors um, that we want to do certain things for our patients and we can't inside the existing system. So you have the freedom to treat your patients how you want. You have the freedom to build the kind of practice and the kind of life that you want. That's huge. However, the flip side of freedom is responsibility, right? There's no guarantee you're going to get a paycheck. If you have a bad month and you can't make payroll, guess who you're going to be, you know, guess who's paying your people? You are out of your pocket. Um, the, there is no safety net, you know? And so when you're looking at entrepreneurship, you need to sort of think about, am I a person who is going to be sort of, crushed by the fear of not having any backup or am i a person that is going to you know enjoy that challenge and and be able to function in that environment of fear and uncertainty with, without it just absolutely like paralyzing me and this is an interesting statistic um there are more emergency medicine physicians um running aesthetics practices than there are dermatologists um because Emergency medicine docs tend to function very well in settings where they have limited information and, and a lot of, you know, and decisions need to be made. They tend to function very well in that. Also, emergency medicine docs tend to be um, not intimidated by procedures. We tend to be very, you know, procedurally oriented um, and we're not afraid of the unknown. So that's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a group that tends to, to match that mindset very well. But it's, um, it's not all easy. It's not all fun. And it's going to take several years to be able to support you and be ready for that. Great advice. Love hearing both the pros and the cons there. Obviously, you you know really love what you do and it really shines. Um, tell us, how can people learn more about Restore and what you're doing? And if anyone's interested in becoming a patient, um, tell us more information about where you're well, serving. I mean, I think the, the best, you know, the best place to go for any information about our, our practice is, is first go to our website. It's uh, www.RestoreMedicalSpa.com. Restore is R-E-S-T-O-R. It has no E because we're very hip, classy people. So you know, you got to have a special name. Um, and on there is, is information about us, about our team, about our procedures, um, everything else that we're doing. Um, and I think that's really the, the, best, the best place to go. Um, we... Um, I think that when you look at our sort of our Google reviews and the things our patients are saying about us on social media and everything, I, I think it really speaks for itself. Um, we, I am very, very, very proud of my team. I am exceptionally proud of the results that we that we give people. Um, I think we do an incredible job, and um, I would welcome anyone to check us out. I think we're fantastic. So <laughs> I think you can't get better care anywhere, <laughs> but I may be biased. Love it. And you're in Colorado, correct? Yes, ma'am. Denver, the Denver and some surrounding stuff. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Waples, for being on the Doc Lounge podcast today. We learned so much and great tips about becoming an entrepreneur from a physician standpoint. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely been a pleasure and hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you to all of our listeners. If you would like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest, please go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.